Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Early Childhood Family Leadership Series. My name is Sherelle Bethel, and I am the Parent Training and Information Director here at Peak Parent Center. Today, you will hear from two presenters, Megan Bowser and Danae Davison. Megan Bowser is a mom of four, including two with additional needs. Her 12-year-old son has multiple disabilities, including deaf blindness, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and autism, and who has introduced her to the world of advocacy. She is now the Executive Director for Family Voices Colorado, assisting families with children with special health care needs, access to health care resources, and government systems they need to thrive. If you are not familiar with Family Voices, we will have the link to their website below. Check them out. Additionally, Megan is the founder and administrator of the Denver Special Needs Parent Community, an online resource connecting over 3,000 local parents to, to peer support. Uh, Danae Davison is one of our parent advisors here at Peak. She has three children, one with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, who guides her passion for families and special education. And you will hear from her in the second part of this presentation. This is the second session in the Early Childhood Family Leadership Series, Being a Family Leader. This series is primarily focused on families with babies through kindergartners, but it is still full of useful information for families with older children as well. We will have four sessions in total and hope that you can join us for all of them. Each of the four sessions was developed with a grant and guidance from two national partners, the DAISY Center and the Center for Parent Information and Resources. Links to resources in the presentation will be available below this video. From the webpage for this webinar, just scroll down and click the button under resources. After each session, we will send the survey out to get your feedback on what worked and what didn't work. This is a fresh run through for this series, so your feedback is very helpful. As a reminder, this series is pre-recorded and there are no live questions, but if you have any questions either right after you watch this video or any time in the future, you can always call Peak Parent Center and ask to speak to a parent advisor. Our number is 719-531-9400. Just a note, we do not provide legal advice or services, and the information in this presentation is for general purposes. The third-party links we provide are not necessarily endorsed by Peak, but are for, for, your, further, for your further information. Uh, as I mentioned, we have four sessions in total. Last, last time we talked about navigating special education, and this session, this is session two, and we will cover what it means to be a family leader. Session three, we will dig into the data in Colorado special education, and session four will be about getting the most out of your child's special education experience. This, these sessions do build upon one another, so we recommend watching them all in order. Today, we will talk about what does it mean to be a family leader? Why do we need family leaders? Where can families be involved? How can I participate? Anything else I should know? Now, I'll hand it over to Megan. All right, thank you for having me. So, advocacy, it's this word you will hear over and over and over in this world. And what does it mean and what does it look like for you and for your family and for your kiddos and for the life you have ahead of you? So I always like to define things. I'm a little bit of a nerd that way. So this advocacy is any action that speaks in favor of, recommends, argues for a cause, supports or defends or pleads on behalf of others. This is really that when you're looking beyond just yourself or, and looking at the causes around you, the other people around you, the bigger impacts to what you're looking for. So that can be your immediate family. That could even be advocating for yourself, but it's advocating or pushing for change within a bigger system. One of the pieces that I often hear is parents and families need to have a seat at the table. When we're talking about our kiddos, we're talking about their needs, that we belong with a seat at the table. And I think it's more than that. It's your table to start with. This is your kiddo. It is their needs. And all those people are here to support them. It's their table to start with. And so it's not just that you have a seat there. It really is your table and your place to start and to guide the conversations as you go through this and to be able to advocate for what their needs are and your family's needs are. So one of the ways we talk about this is this circles of engagement, just this graphic that tells that shows us kind of the different areas we can be involved in and as that may grow. And there's no obligation. Not everybody has to do the all the circles. It's going to be where you fall at any different point in your life. And oftentimes we start one place and then as we get more involved, that will grow with time. But knowing kind of what's out there and what you may aspire to or where you may end up can help you to see 
the power and the strength in your voice as you interact with these systems. So we kind of go from the inside to the out. So we'll talk about each more specifically, but it really starts with the individual. It starts with you, your immediate family, your child, and then grows to those immediately around you, your friends, your family, the people you interact with virtually every day, and then wider to that community, the social, the schools, your kids in the kids in the neighborhood that are around them, maybe your religious organization or the library that's near you, that close community, the people that you still see in li real life now that it's not COVID um, and see on a somewhat regular basis. And then it grows to this organizational. And sometimes we see these people in the organizations a lot, but it's at this higher level. And then finally we get to this public policy, the highest level of where the, the biggest overarching umbrella decisions are made that you grow kind of as your, in, your impact grows from that beginning where you start out in these different areas. So we'll talk about each of them a little bit more. So the first is the individual. It's the me, my family, focusing on you, your child, your family. And this is where we all start. And this is really the core and the foundation of where we are. This is what motivates our passion. This is what feels most important. And this is what inspires us day in and day out to keep going is that you look at that little kiddo that you've got and you know that you need to advocate for them and to give them the best life possible. So that's where we start. And that's where all of us should start and keep as our foundation, that that's what keeps you grounded in what is most motivating and in what is most important within these worlds. That is the source of your motivation and your um your, the power of your voice. That's a, a huge piece of what you can bring is that real life experience that I know you think this system should work this way, but here's my experience within it. And here's what I've seen. And let me tell you how it could serve us better or how this um, one situation, you can serve my kiddo better. How can these, situ these systems work well for that individual, that child that needs services and the family unit as a whole? So that's where we start and we can never let go of that middle piece. So as we kind of work our way out of these circles, the next place is this interpersonal. So this is the wider family, the friends that come around. Oftentimes this is the grandparents, the aunts and uncles. It might be the close family, the close friends that you've had for a really long time. And really when our kiddos especially are young or they're first diagnosed or they're first start receiving services, we really need to stay in that first circle and, and make sure that our needs are met there. But then once you're kind of starting to get things established there, it's easier to look up and, and see that wider family. Because oftentimes while the family, the immediate family may have a lot of grief or questions or a lot to figure out, then once you've kind of work through some of that, you can see those same needs in the family and friends around you. So sometimes the grandparents are really grieving for their own child and their own child's, the difference that their parenting journey went, the different path their parenting journey went on than what the grandparent had expected for their own child. So they have some some needs there too. And they also need to learn. They need to learn how to interact with the child. They need to learn how to include them. They need to learn that they want to be invited to all the things, even if their needs might look a little bit different, or they might need to leave early, or they might not be able to come to all the things. This is the invite us to birthday party still, or we're going to show up for five minutes and then we're going to peace out because it is too much for my kiddo to handle being in this environment for too long. But it's that sharing your child's needs with those that are close to you that really care and are invested in your family, but often don't know what to do. They're not sure how to interact. They're not sure what additional needs your kiddo has or doesn't have. And so they need some of that advocacy there to teach, to teach them. One of my examples was um, at Christmas time, it can be really overwhelming. And we have always gone around where each person opens one present at a time. And my son hates present opening, hates it. He thinks this whole thing is really overwhelming. It's loud. He doesn't like new things. So he never likes a new present. Even if he'll like it a month from now, he doesn't like it on Christmas and the day when they do that. And it took a long time for me to be able to share with my 
wider family that this was not going to work for him the way we had always done it needed to be modified for his needs and that maybe he could be in the room with us listening to his own music and that we would open his presents for him and we could look at them and smile and then I could slowly introduce them to him one at a time when there wasn't a lot of people, it wasn't new, and there were a lot of new things all at once. But that really required me to be able to talk to them about what his needs are and expand that reach beyond just me and my husband and their siblings, but to that wider family piece as well. So we start with our immediate, our individual, our child, and then we can move out and look at the family that is closest to us, the friends that we see on a regular basis and advocate for the kiddos needs and what they might need in those environments as well. Then it starts to grow. Beyond that is we start to interact more and more in this community. So you've got a medical team. You might go to doctor's appointments or therapy appointments, and they're going to be able to have a lot of expertise to share with you, but they also aren't with your child day in and day out every day. So you are, remember, it's your table. You are the preeminent expert on your child and their needs. Each peer, each professional that you're going to interact with has their own area that they're an expert in. So the OT, the occupational therapist may know occupational therapy. They may know sensory, they may know fine motor really, really well, but they need you to be able to advocate for beyond just that one therapy to understand how they slept last night or what the physical therapist had them do, or what the speech therapist wanted them to do. All the many pieces that interact with that, that you need to be able to articulate to them. Also medical teams to be able to ask questions and articulate to them what you've seen in all these different contexts. And have confidence in that, that you are the expert on your child, and that the professionals around you really need to respect that. And some of them are amazing and really will see you as that expert. And some need some pushing and prodding in order to recognize that um, and really treat it as such. But you coming in with that confidence about that can really make a huge difference. And it makes a difference not just for your own child, but can make a difference for the other people those professionals interact with. So when you're talking to their special education teacher one day when they're in school, that that teacher would see the interactions you have with them, your ability to advocate for your child, and it'll impact them in the way they work with your child, but may impact the way they work with other children in their program as well. So your advocacy grows beyond just your own child benefiting, but beyond, but to others that those professionals are interacting with. This can also look like getting your kid involved in sports programs or swim lessons at your local recreation center. Things that typically developing kids their age would do that your child, even if they have additional needs or diagnoses, have a right to do and should get to enjoy. And so interacting with those programs to find ways to make it successful for your kiddo and to develop programs that are going to benefit not just your child, but other children as well. So this can be with neighborhoods as well. It can be with religious communities. There's all these, these areas that we interact with that are in our wider community that really become the support for your child and for their, um, their they become their community ongoing. It's also really important for our kids to have a community that is beyond just mom and dad. Sometimes when there are um, they might have immune, might be immune compromised or have other um, things that make it harder to get out into the community. It can be very limiting and very isolating, but it's amazing when you can find those ways to make it happen for them to interact with more adults and more kids beyond just the ones that are in your immediate household because they will grow in their ability to be independent. Their communication will increase because mom and dad always understand them better than the stranger will. And that forces the kiddos to find new ways to communicate, whether that's their facial expressions or being louder or whatever it is. It's amazing the way they can grow when they are involved in this wider community. And so it really is worth the advocacy effort to help them um, interact in these avenues and be successful in those, whether that's through school or medical or therapies, but also in those 
typical things within the community, like swim lessons and sports and dance class and all the different things they might interact with. So we start with the kiddo. We think about in the kind of immediate family, we think about the wider family and friends. And then we think about the community that they may, that they have around them that they may need to interact with. But all these pieces kind of grow on each other to see, well, what's the next step? How do we make bigger change to make the world a more accessible place and help them to be more independent in the world as well? So then we get beyond just the people we actually interact interact with one-on-one -on -one and talk about these systems level advocacy. So this is talking about within those hospitals, within the insurance world, within their mental health systems, any of those systems that you interact with, within the education system, but beyond just the classroom teacher or the therapist that are interacting with your child directly, we're talking about the school board or the the administrators within the school district. We're talking about the wider people that we call them, often call them change or decision makers, that they're the people that are going to make policies, enforce policies that have a wider impact. And your voice is so essential for them to hear. And not everyone, but the vast majority of people in these systems got there for really great reasons. They love our kiddos. They want to care for them well. They want them to succeed and get the things that they need. And But sometimes when they've been doing it for a while, they can lose sight of the individual that they're actually serving. And so your voice is so powerful on these committees and in these meetings to share the actual impact of these policies that can often seem very abstract at the policy level, but to know what does it look like when there's an individual child that is receiving services or needing assistance and what are their needs. So there are lots of opportunities for getting involved at this level. Some of those are most hospitals, children's hospital included, has a lot of different committees for different departments, hospital-wide. They have these advisory committees that you can sign up for and volunteer to be on and that you sit and do meetings and they'll bring presenters in and you get to give input on what your experience is, ask questions, give recommendations for how the systems may serve you better. Um, one example is we sat and talked on a committee for Children's Hospital about um, their scheduling process. What does it look like when a family actually calls in to make an appointment? And the realization I had in this conversation was the people that were making the policies, that were setting up the phone systems, that were saying what things should be, had never actually called the line and gotten put on hold or talked to the schedule. They hadn't actually been at that base level to know what's the actual experience. And when we told them what our experiences were, they were surprised. They, they thought the system worked much differently than it did and were able to make some significant changes in some departments, not all, in order to make that experience better and more effective for families. So that voice can have a huge um, impact there's also a lot of opportunities within the Medicaid world. If your kiddo gets on Medicaid or gets on a Medicaid waiver at one point, um, there's also within your school board. So almost all school boards have um, parent advisory committees or um, even the individual schools have their PTAs and that special, that voice of kiddos that have additional needs in that special education world or disability world really huge impact on those committees because often that voices of a minority within the school system and it gets lost, even though it's really important and important, not just for the kiddos receiving special education services, but for the school as a whole and the culture and the climate and the district as a whole as well. So really when you can step and advocate at the systems level, you'll see more change start to happen that impacts your individual child at the base where your passion came from, but you can see how that impact will go beyond just them. That if you get the school board to make a different decision, that is going to change what it looks like for your child and for many other children that are within the school district or the hospital to change a policy or Medicaid to change policies or your health insurance or any of those systems that you're making a change that impacts more than just your one child, even though they're always at the root and the core of what you decide to do. 
a lot of people will get to this point and like they're good here. But I will tell you, the longer you sit at this point, the more you get pulled into that fifth ring of the circle. And sometimes even if you think that you're only going to advocate for your own child and their needs, the more you do it, it gets a little addictive and you start to grow and grow in your skills and what you're willing and desiring to change. So the last circle on this is this public policy, and that can be national or state, it could be local as well too, but it's these um, bigger, wider policy changes that have enforcement behind them and have funding behind them usually that make really wide changes. So think of before IDEA, so Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, before that was a thing, special education wasn't guaranteed and often wasn't available. But by people speaking up and saying that wasn't okay, we need more, think of how big of an impact that has had. And that's a really big piece of pol public policy change. And so that can happen, right? The um, ADA, the uh, Disability Act, Adult uh, Accessibility Disability Act, whatever ADA stands for, sorry, um, has a wide impact on the world. The IDEA, the education bill, has a wide impact on the world and on our um, culture and the way individuals with disabilities are treated and interact with society and are given access to services. This can also look um, like individual policies going through. One example is this past year, we did um, a bill about kiddos who are deafblind needing support specific to being deafblind in their communities so they could get assistance in the school system. But once they left school, there was nothing in the community that was deafblind specific to meet their vision and hearing needs to allow them to communicate and participate in their communities. So we went to our state legislature, we found a representative, we got them to be a sponsor and write a, get a bill writer who wrote a bill to create a program that would provide services outside in their community beyond the school day. And it does not always go super smoothly, but oftentimes, and in this particular one, that bill goes to committee. So before a group of representatives or a group of senators, to be able to present it and explain why it's really important. And so as an advocate and as a family, you have a really important role in those committee hearings even to be able to share your story and bring them back from seeing this overarching policy that often costs money back to the individual child and what the impact would be and how it's important for an individual who really deserves the, the, the supports and services they need in order to be independent and successful in their lives. So your voice can have a huge impact at that level. And then if it passes out of committee, then it can go to be a vote by the entire rep, um, House of Representatives or the Senate. And then if it passes both, then it can be enacted into law and signed by the governor. Same policy at the national level, but that voice is really important, again, to bring these people that are sitting at the policy level, usually for good reasons and for with good motives, but to bring them back to remind them who those consumers are that they're actually trying to serve, who the kiddos are, who the families are that really need these services. I got pulled somewhat kicking and screaming into this fifth circle that I had no interest in being pulled into this legislative world. Um, but the more you do it and the more you interact and you see representatives tearing up, hearing your story, it makes a huge impact. And you can see the other lives that are impacted in addition to just your one child's and the power of your voice and your story and your experience as you go through those pieces. All of this to be said, you can spend a lot of time going through all of these rings and being very motivated, but remember to keep that foundation strong. That there are times where we maybe have been at the Capitol advocating and talking at committees every day. Not Most of us never are there every day. But spending a lot of time at these higher levels and policy meetings and committee meetings, and there are times where a crisis happens or a change is happening, a transition is happening, where a kid is going from 
early intervention to school or going from elementary school to middle school or graduating high school and transitioning into adult programs where you need to circle back and go back to that foundation and spend some time just staying in that inner circle to keep that foundation strong and make sure that you're rooted and grounded so that you've got these amazing stories to tell that can make an impact to your family, to your community, at the policy level, but also at the wider public policy level as you grow through them. And keeping that, that your passion and your experience and your the story is rooted in where you've come from and that that has a tremendous impact to these people that are there to serve your family and your child and as their root cause of why they're there to remind them of who that is and remind yourself of why you're there and why you're advocating in this area. Keep your foundation strong. I love that. That was so good, Megan. Thank you so much for that talk and for joining us today. Um, as far as what it means to be a family leader, Megan, you are it. So thank you so much for your wisdom always um, and for that wonderful chat. So um, family, a family leader shares their perspective and lived experience to help inform systems change, expand the knowledge of decision makers and give a voice to families. So much, Megan. Um, so sharing your stories, kind of summarizing what Megan had just said, um, sharing what you've learned, recognizing that your story represents a group. If it's happening to your family or if that's your family's experience, it's probably also the experience of others. And just participating, joining advisory boards, school boards, committees, outreaching to representatives, all of those things fall under the category of family leader. Um, the hope is that policies and funding are decided by people who are open to hearing your family's stories and challenges because decision makers might not have any experience with being a parent of a child with a disability. And if you think about it, it if everything is only tailored to the majority experience, then everyone besides those in the middle of that S curve, or maybe I'm thinking bell curve, the one that goes this way anyway. <laughs> so everyone that is on the center of that curve, right? The bulk of, of people's experiences, um, if everything's designed for just that middle piece, then everyone on the edges will be at a disadvantage, right? So people with disabilities are already often underrepresented in decision-making now. And this can lead to a lack of funding, a lack of infrastructure, uh, policies, and lack of jobs even. So sometimes it feels like invisibility equals powerlessness. So maybe people's stories can make a bit of a difference. Um, if you don't know the Katie Beckett story, I recommend reading about it and I will add a link in the resources below. It's a great example of how one family's story changed major policies to allow children with disabilities to be at home with their families. So Katie's story actually improved a lot of things for many of us. It's a really great story if you don't know it. So I recommend that. Um, so the other part is that we, we need family leaders. And it's not just Megan and I that feel there is a need for family leaders. OSEP, the Office of Special Education Programs, which is housed under the Department of Ed, um, they also acknowledge that family participation is really important. And they actually issue guidance on how to better involve families at the local level. Uh, they measure data on how well families are being included in decision making about their children in special education. And this whole series, this whole four part series was actually um, in part intended to help better equip families to participate, whether at the IEP level or in PTA, PTA groups or in state level committees. And the stated intention, according to OSEP, the OSEP level is to assess and improve the quality of services, to examine disparities in services and supports, um, to advocate for federal, state and local policy change and investments, increase awareness and understanding and achieve positive and equitable outcomes for children and families. Um, and leaders in Colorado also want to hear from you. You met Heidi White in session one, and you'll meet another state leader in session um, three. Uh, and I've sat on groups with both of them, and they are people at the state decision level, the state, state decision-making level, um, and they care about family experience, and they're passionate about early childhood. And so they'll really make sure that you get the chance to be heard. Um, 
And they even agreed, agreed to join this series despite their very busy schedules, as you can imagine, because they wanted to reach out to us. They wanted to reach out to families. And where am I needed in Colorado? Um, where, are, where can families be involved? Well, there are many opportunities to get involved in Colorado. And there's a list here, the links um, on the slide will be available in the resources tab below again. I have had the honor of serving on the ICC, which is that interagency coordinating council. Every state, I believe, has one of these. And it's a, kind of focused on managing um, decisions uh, around early intervention. So just write, you write a big report uh, as a group to make recommendations for changes or improvements in early intervention in the state, in Colorado. Um, and I've learned a lot about what I'm sharing with you in this series from just spending time there. Reaching out to your representatives is another way to be involved when you don't have time or interest to be on a committee. ARC Colorado actually posts a very convenient list of proposed bills coming through the legislature that might affect things either for the better or the worse for, people's, for people with disabilities in Colorado. A um, couple other things to consider are that Sometimes there are travel reimbursements for parents to participate um, because they really do want your participation. And, you know, really the desire is to have participation from a broad range of different areas. So urban and rural and all parts of the state, things like that. Also, you don't have to be, you don't have to have a child still in early intervention or in preschool to apply to some of these. Uh, the Interagency Coordinating Council suggests having a recent experience with early intervention, but recent can be several years ago, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a Colorado experience, I found out, because my daughter was in early intervention in Oregon, but I was still able to participate here, and many things overlapped, so that worked fine. And then we're going to get a little bit more into the nitty-gritty of systems here. How can I participate? Systems change is where relationships between different parts of the system have changed towards improved outcomes and goals. It's driven by transformational, not just transactional change to create a lasting difference. So what is a system? Systems are different parts that interact to create an outcome, the food web, your body systems, an ecosystem. When thinking about all the parts of the early childhood system, I find this iceberg model very helpful. Uh, let's start at the top. Events are events, individual things that happen. This is where most of us interact with any system. An event might be that the speech therapist works with a child once a week, and this might be all we have time to think about. Our participation at this level is a reaction to whatever the event is. We schedule the appointment, we have the therapy session. But if you want to dig a bit deeper, you'll start to notice that pa a pattern occurs. Um, a personal example would be that if the speech therapist brings a mu musical toy and your child is much more engaged, or if your child has a snack right before the session, they're just more receptive. So you might start encouraging these patterns to occur. Um, you purchase a musical toy, you schedule snack time, you start to anticipate what will be helpful at a community scale, think back to the indicators that I mentioned in session one. Um, the pattern might be about a whole county, something like, and I'm just making this up, 88% of children in EI in Adams County improve with speech therapy. Maybe that's the pattern. And therefore you can anticipate that if you are in Adams County and your child receives early intervention speech therapy, they're very likely to, to improve. And again, I just, I made that example up, so I didn't get it from anywhere. Um, and then the focus of underlying structures is what do we need to do to support our hoped for events and patterns? So this includes things like laws and policies, where the money goes, personnel and workforce and how they're trained, data systems to keep track of it all, accountability to assess it all. Um, so this is where a lot of government work happens and where the design of systems becomes really important. Um, it's very much where the complex bureaucracy <laughs> lives versus efficiency, but this is also where it can be improved. For example, in one state, all EI providers had to bill for their services through each county office, and then the county office in turn billed their state health department. So it took a long time for providers to get their paychecks. Then the underlying structure was redesigned and there was a decision made 
And so they said, let's revise the system so that early intervention providers can just bill directly. So this saved hundreds of thousands of dollars in both time and resources. Forming the foundation of all these above steps, all of the iceberg are the attitudes, the beliefs, the values that the system is based on. And these are the mental models. They reflect our values and beliefs as a group, as a society. When we are talking about family leadership, this is one of the areas where sharing your story can be transformative to the entire system. Your story might transform the mental model that the whole system is based on. And in fact, the beginnings of IDEA law were because of families speaking up on behalf of their children. IDEA law says disability is a natural part of the human experience and in no way diminishes the right of individuals to participate in or contribute to society. With this revolutionary idea in 1975, children with disabilities started having the right to an education. Um, now I'm going to use this as an example of how the iceberg systems theory works. So we'll work our way up. As people accepted this mental model of IDEA, that disability in no way diminishes rights, the underlying structures to support this started to be things like specific laws, funding, special education teachers and programs, assistive technology, the Americans with Disabilities Act support some of this, um, and more. And so going up another level, looking at the pattern today, there are over 7.5 million children in the US receiving special education services. And then that event at the very top, the, the product of all this, is that people who are always capable now have a ch real chance at living a whole life in community. As a person with a disability who is a successful lawyer, an artist, a comedian, a business owner, a friend, a neighbor, all those things. So you can see how the best possibilities for your child can really come from reinforcing these positive mental models and sharing your story to bring us back to the roots of our values as a society. Another way to think about participating in systems is the levels of engagement approach. I'm mentioning this because it's used in a lot of government work. Um, it's also called the leading by convening framework. It provides a little more detail on how it might look to engage with advocacy. So informing is that lightest level, um, sharing or disseminating information with others who care about the issue. It's very top down one way communication. An example would be attending this webinar reading the procedural safeguards or reading a newsletter to be up to date on what's going on. And then networking is that next level down, asking a select group what they think about an issue or listening and listening to what they say. That's kind of a two-way, limited two-way communication. An example would be parent groups, joining parent groups, attending a conference, participating in online communities, um, you could call Peak and we could chat about all of the things in the series and we could go back and forth on it. Um, I'd love that. Um, okay, collaborating. Collaborating is that next level and that's engaging in a more um, representative group of stakeholders who care about the issue and, trying, and are trying to work together around the, that issue to make a change. Um, that would be serving on those committees, partnering on projects, and participating in IEP meetings. That is very much a collaborative process of trying to work on making a change that everyone wants needs to agree on. And then transforming is very much a part of the leading by convening framework and facilitating those deep cross stakeholder engagement activities. Uh, leadership and building consensus. So this is where you might have groups of people that don't necessarily agree on something coming together and trying to reach a consensus, um, at least a compromise, if not like total agreement. So those examples would be advocating for a policy change, taking on lead roles in speaking, organizing, gathering information. Um, and not everyone is comfortable at all these levels and no one is doing one of these categories all the time, even within the same group. And one level is not necessarily better or worse than others. Some of it will depend on how much time you have, what you're most interested in, where the most change is needed, what you get drawn into. Um, and what else do I need to know? So this is just my last slide pretty much. Um, do watch the next session because it gets really into the data in Colorado. And remember that your voice is wanted, is needed, is valid. Figure out what in your story applies to a group and represents a community. Remember, if it's your experience, it's going to be someone else's experience as well. And try to share effectively, you know, use active listening, build consensus. Um, 
this is where my, my little quote comes in, in this from Thomas Jefferson, in matters of style, swim with the current, in matters of principle, stand like a rock. I like that one, sorry, my daughter's joining in um, as it goes, working from home. And then also I'm gonna attach an acronyms cheat sheet because there's a lot of acronyms in this kind of work and I'll put that below in the resources. And that's it. Next time we'll just, we'll dig into that Colorado data and we'll chat about special education. How do we know if it's working and what do we do with the data? And what about my own school district? And then also using that data to improve things. And that's it. We'll see you next time.